welcome to the Holy Land and this biblical site of Tel Dan. We are shooting this talk right in front of the altar here and the high place. So the significant thing that happened here in Tel Dan that we're, we're going to be talking about, and of course we're going to be talking about some of the backstory so we really fully understand this place. But right here where the uh, steel is, that was the altar. And then up above that was a platform, and that is what uh, Jeroboam did. He built two altars with golden calves. One was in Bethel, which is south. That's kind of in the southern part of the northern tribes. And then in Tel Dan, he built this golden calf. Now what takes place here is pivotal because this is now going to be the beginning point, the first chapter in the downfall of the ten tribes of Israel and their eventual deportation. So at this biblical site, we'll be looking at the location of this place and why that's so important. We'll talk about the historical background of this location. We'll be looking at some of the amazing places of interest at this site. We'll see the key events in the Bible that took place here. And we'll end with the faith lesson in order to learn the major lessons God desires for us from this important biblical site. So I think you'll find this video very enlightening and transforming to your life. Now the location of the city of Dan is in the northernmost part of Israel, about 24 miles or 38 kilometers north of the Sea of Galilee. It is in a well-watered lush area which is superb for agriculture. It's at the base of Mount Hermon, which is Israel's highest mountain. The mountain provides most of the water for the Jordan River and the northern part of Israel. Now this mighty city of Dan was located on the crossroads of major ancient travel routes. Of these, the main travel route was called the Via Maris, which linked Africa and Egypt with Asia and Europe. The earliest findings from a settlement at Tel Dan date to around 5,000 years BC. Later, a city was built here during the Canaanite period in around 2700 BC. The Canaanite city was approximately 50 acres or 25 hectares in size and dates to around 1850 BC. It was surrounded by a wall which reached a height of 30 to 50 feet or 10 to 15 meters and was around 25 feet or seven meters wide at its base. The tell is identified also with the city of Laish, or also known as Leshem, and was captured by the tribe of Dan in the period of the Judges. The tribe of Dan found it difficult to deal with the Philistines in the area which they were allotted, which was between Jerusalem and the Mediterranean Sea, and therefore decided to go north in search of new territory. In Judges 18.27 it says, They proceeded to Laish, a people tranquil and unsuspecting, and they put them to the sword and burned down the town. There was none to come to the rescue, for it was distant from Sidon. They rebuilt the town and settled there, and they named the town Dan, after their ancestor Dan, who was one of Jacob's sons. After conquering the city, the Danites renamed the city to Dan in around 1350 BC. When referring to Israel, the phrase is often used which says, from Dan to Beersheba. It says in 1 Kings 4.25, Judah and Israel live safely, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, from Dan even to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. So once again, this was a phrase that was used. Beersheba was to the southernmost part of Israel, and Dan here was in the northernmost part. Now in order to help you understand and appreciate all that happened here, let's take a tour and show you all the places of interest at this amazing site. We'll start at the park entrance, which is on the west side of the city, and move to the east side of the park. And you can see a map here of what we'll be looking at. And as we go through the tour, we'll be referencing this map as well. So we'll start with the park entrance. 
From here, visitors enter and are introduced to an amazing historical site that encompasses both rich blessings and deep sin and destruction. And we'll be talking about this later on in the video. Entering the Tel Dan Reserve is like stepping into a wonderland. There are many bubbling brooks that feed into a large running river. Tall treetops reach for the sky, and the ground is always shaded and refreshingly cool, even at noon on a hot summer's day. It's no wonder that some 7,000 years ago, people chose this area by these springs as the spot to make their homes and set up their civilizations. Now the water source for Tel Dan comes from a massive spring. It is one of the most plentiful springs in the Middle East and is fed by the snow that accumulates on Mount Hermon every winter and then trickles down to the springs at the foot of the hill. This massive spring produces cool water at a steady temperature throughout the year. Of the three sources of the Jordan River, the Dan Stream, which originates here, is the largest and most important. The remains of a number of flour mills were found here at Tel Dan, which used the strong current of the water to turn the millstones and grind flour. The flour mill that can be seen today was in operation until the 1960s. The mill was built about 150 years ago and operated on water power until 1948. The mill has two pairs of millstones. There is also a Pooh Bear tree named after Winnie the Pooh. Now this is a large, old, narrow-leafed ash tree whose trunk is hollow. And as a result, it attracts both children and adults. In the past, there were other trees on the slopes of Tel Dan, such as the Palestinian oak and the Mount Aslis mastic tree, but these were destroyed by fire due to the negligence of hikers. There is also a place called the Pistachio Lookout, named after a tree. The circumference of the tree is more than six meters around. A beautiful shady place in the park is called the Wading Pool. And this is a shallow pool that is part of the hiking trail. It's an excellent place to get your feet wet in the cool and refreshing waters of the pool. It has also been recently expanded and surrounded by a wooden deck and benches. The wading pool is the only place in the park where it's permitted to get into the water and play and paddle around. Towards the center of Tel Dan, is a place called the Garden of Eden or also Paradise Springs. This area consists of calmly babbling brooks creating channels along which a well-developed riverside forest grows. This is the only place in Israel with a wetland forest of northern trees. This forest is shady throughout the year and is home to many climbing type species of plants. Cool bubbling springs flow from the base of this area around the trees and they're populated by rare salamanders and invertebrates. It consists of two major springs called the Tel and Leshem Springs. Now next we see this false god worship site that Jeroboam set up and we'll be talking more about this in detail but just a brief overview here. In 930 BC, the kingdom was divided and Jeroboam established false god worship centers in Bethel and here in Dan. He erected a golden calf in Dan and built a building to house the sacrificial high places. The altar stood in front of this large platform surrounded by finely chiseled stones. A metal frame that you can see here indicates what the shape and size would have been. What I want to show you up close here is the altar. So we have the altar right here and you can see the size that it would have been. You can see the stones here. So this was the altar. Here is where they sacrificed the animals. Up here is where the platform for the golden calf was at. So the, so the sacrifices were made here to this golden calf. So as we mentioned in the same way in Jerusalem you had an altar in front of the temple to the true and living God. Here you had an altar to this false god, this golden calf. Near this area, archaeologists discovered a round reservoir from the Hellenistic period as well as animal bones. 
On the western side of the site, the team uncovered small altar rooms and priestly chambers with special implements or utensils for offering incense, which included shovels and other various items. On the massive platform that you can see here is where the golden calf that Jeroboam erected was located. And we'll talk more about this later on in our talk about this site. So what I want to show you here now is we had the altar down below and then right up here was the platform. And then the golden calf sat up here on the, the platform, large golden calf, huge. And then once again, the altar down there where they sacrificed to this golden calf uh, right here. Now there's also a command post lookout here. Now these trenches served the Israelite defense forces until the Six Day War in 1967. They show a view of the old patrol road, the slopes of Mount Hermon, the abandoned Syrian outpost of Nukhela, and the village of El Hiyam in Lebanon. Now as you can see in the front of this gate is a large plaza. This would be an area where the townspeople would gather, they would meet, they would talk, they would just fellowship and get together. Also in front of the gate is a bench or small raised platform on which the ruler or judge of the city would sit. It's possible this is where the delegations made offerings to the king of the city. At the base are small decorated stone pots that are believed to have been used for supporting a canopy over the small platform. Just to the side, along the wall, is a bench that was likely used for the elders or prominent leaders of the city. So in the Bible, it talks a lot about the elders, the leaders, the kings, the judges, meeting and sitting at the gate entrances. So you can get a good idea of what that would have been like. So in the plaza area, once again, the people would meet, but at the entrance there was this seat and then the bench for the elders. And this is where they would hear cases or talk with people and do important prominent things. When this inner gate was unearthed, there was an amazing discovery of a doorstop and hinge sockets from which giant wooden doors once would have swung. Now also around this main city gate entrance is evidence of some cultic worship items. Now we know that this is quite certain because it says that when the Danites were traveling north to conquer the city of Laish, they stopped in Ephraim and stole household gods from a man named Micah. They also brought his own false priest to bring to Dan and lead them in their own false worship. So there is evidence of this cultic worship here at the entrance of the gate. And you can see these cultic stones which have been found here that testify to this fact. Now just inside this main massive outer gate and just up the hill a bit is the inner gate location of Dan that the Israelites had built here as well. So both this outer gate and this inner gate are both now from the Israelite period starting in around 1350 BC when the tribe of Dan captured this area. Around this city gate and just inside are traces of ruins in which archaeologists have excavated and found residential houses of the city which date to the time of the Canaanites and the Israelites. Another amazing discovery here at Tel Dan is an ancient Canaanite gate. And this was found here in 1979. It's 23 feet high or 7 meters high and it's made out of brick and it has 47 courses that are still preserved. The most remarkable discovery from this part of the tell is that the gate remained completely intact. Its arch-shaped lintel is one of the earliest complete arches found in the world and one of the only ones still standing. Now this Canaanite gate is also known or called Abraham's gate as it's very likely Abraham was here and possibly entered through this gate. In Genesis 14:14, 14, 14, the Bible speaks about this possibility. It says, when Abram, who was later called Abraham, heard that his relative had been taking, speaking about Lot, 
he led out his trained men, born in his house, 318, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. So for this reason, this gate here is also called Abraham's Gate. Now as you can see, a large canopy has been placed over this gate to protect it from weather and erosion. Now another fascinating discovery here at Tel Dan is a piece of stela or an engraved stone tablet from around 850 BC that was unearthed here in 1993. Carved into this stone tablet is an inscription of Hazael, king of Damascus, boasting of his victory over the king of Israel and the king of the house of David. Now this is the first time that the words house of David were found outside of the Bible. So they have been found here in this discovery here, which gives evidence that the Bible is true, that King David did exist, and his kingdom to the south and even over all of Israel was in existence. Now in order to fully understand and appreciate all that took place here, let's set the stage and look at the background of everything that took place here. So now we're going to talk about this event from the Bible and learn what all really happened here. So this is going to be an exciting and meaningful yet sobering time as we look here at what happened. Now as mentioned, the Canaanites inhabited the land in this area from about 5,000 to 1400 BC. The conquest of the Promised Land under Joshua took place in about 1400 BC, and it was sometime after that that the Danites came here. So sometime later, probably in around 1350 BC, or shortly thereafter, the tribe of Dan relocated from central Israel to this place. When they did so, they brought some false gods with them and began to worship God in a backwards, unbiblical way. They conquered this area and named the town Dan. In around 930 BC, because of King Solomon's disobedience in his latter years, the kingdom of Israel was divided. Rehoboam took the southern two tribes of Israel, and Jeroboam took the northern ten tribes. From this point on, as found in 1 Kings 11, the name Israel would refer to the northern ten tribes, and Judah would refer to the southern two tribes. So as we find in 1 Kings 11 and forward, Israel would be a divided kingdom. It was under Jeroboam's reign that this altar and the altar in Bethel was set up to worship golden calves that he made. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. It should be noted, however, that under Josiah's reign in about 640 BC, he somewhat united the kingdom and had power and influence in the northern part of Israel. Now it should be mentioned that after the northern ten tribes were deported in around 722 BC that some people will call them, these ten tribes that were deported, the ten lost tribes of Israel. However, this is really not the case. When Jeroboam set up his false god worship, as we saw, many who feared the Lord fled and went to live in Judah and Jerusalem. Additionally, when the king of Assyria was conquering the northern ten tribes of Israel from around 730 to 700 BC, many fled to Jerusalem from the northern ten tribes and lived on the western hill of the city of Jerusalem. It would be King Hezekiah who would build a wall around this refugee camp, so to speak, prior to King Sennacherib's attempt to destroy Jerusalem in around 701 BC. Now unfortunately, it was because of King Solomon that the nation became divided and fell into the worship of false gods. Scripture recounts how Solomon turned from the Lord in his latter years and introduced the worship of false gods into the nation. When you think of Scripture, I was talking to my good friend here, Dan, as we were, we were uh, traveling, who do you think would be the greatest failures in the Bible? Probably the number one would be Judas, betrays Christ. My pick for number second would be Solomon. Even though he wrote three books of the Bible, he wrote Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. But what did Solomon do? Solomon in his latter years, and I'll just read this uh, phrase to you, it says in 1 Kings 11, 1 and 2, it says, 
Now King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the sons of Israel, you shall not associate with them, nor shall they associate with you, for they will surely turn your heart away after their gods. Solomon held fast to these in love, Scripture says. Then in 1 Kings eleven six it says, Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not follow the Lord fully as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemish, the detestable idol of Moab, on the mountain which is east of Jerusalem, and that would be the Mount of Olives, and for Molech, the detestable idol of the sons of Ammon. Thus also he did for all his foreign wives, who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. Now the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice, and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. Now this is interesting. The God appeared to Solomon and warned him not to go after these other gods, yet he did not listen. And it says, but he did not observe what the Lord had commanded. So the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. And that servant would be Jeroboam, and then Rehoboam would be Solomon's son who took the southern two tribes. So Rehoboam takes the southern two tribes of Israel, which are called Judah from this time forward, and Jeroboam received the northern ten tribes of Israel, which would be called Israel from this time forward. Now even though the kingdom of Israel was divided, God appeared to Jeroboam and promised to bless him if he would serve him. So in 1 Kings 11:38 it says, then it will be, and this is God now talking to Jeroboam, then it will be that if you listen to all that I command you and walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight by observing my statutes and my commandments as my servant David did, then I will be with you and build you an enduring house as I built for David, and I will give Israel to you." So God is this gracious, merciful God. He's just always giving, not only us, but He's just always giving people second chances, okay? Now if you'll follow me, I'll bless you. If you'll just get your act together, I will bless you. Do you think Jeroboam listens? This is what happens. First Kings 12, 25 it says, Then Jeroboam built Shechem, and will be going there in the hill country of Ephraim and live there. And he went from there and built Penuel. Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom will return to the house of David, meaning down to the southern part of Israel, to, the, to Judah, if this people go to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. Then the heart of this people will return to their Lord, even to Rehoboam, king of Judah. When he says to their Lord, he's talking about Rehoboam in this situation, king of Judah. So Judah, once again, is now the name of the southern two tribes of Israel. And they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So the king consulted and made two golden calves. And he said to them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, O Israel. Israel's now the ten northern tribes, that brought you from the land of Egypt. He set one in Bethel, we'll be going there, and the other he put in Dan. Now this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the ones as far as Dan. And he made houses on high places, and made priests from among the people, who were not of the sons of Levi. It's according to scripture, a priest could only come from the, the Levitical priesthood line, but he did not honor that. God warns him again, 
He's going to come and give him another severe warning because he's doing this. He's going to give him another chance, but do you think he listens? So it says in 1 Kings 13, 33, even after this, Jeroboam did not change his evil ways, but once more appointed priests for the high places from all sorts of people. Anyone who wanted to become a priest, he consecrated for the high places. This was the sin of the house of Jeroboam that led to its downfall and its destruction from the face of the earth. So God warns him, Jeroboam does not listen, and then this is the result, and this was the downfall then that led to, uh, as scripture says, its downfall and its destruction. So the summary of Jeroboam's life could be said that he chose to fear people instead of God, or he chose fear over faith. So Jeroboam was afraid that if he allowed the people to go to Jerusalem, that they would defect, that he might lose his life or whatever. So he said, in order to, to save himself, he was looking out for his own interest, he built two altars with golden calves. One was in Bethel, which is south. That's kind of in the southern part of the northern tribes. And then in Tel Dan, he built this golden calf. Okay, so you would probably have about half of the 10 tribes going to Bethel. You would have half of the 10 tribes coming up here. So there was a city here, it was called the city of Dan. And so it was a beautiful area and we've walked through it as we've come up, plenty of water. And so the city of Dan serviced all of the at least five tribes or maybe more that would come up here to worship. So in the same way in Jerusalem, there was the altar in front of the temple and they would sacrifice at the altar. Then they would be sacrificing to the true God in the temple. Here they had an altar, but the sacrifices to were, were to this golden calf. And why was it a golden calf? Well, probably because when the Israelites came out of Egypt and then they were at the foot of Mount Sinai and Moses went up on the mountain, he was up there. What did Aaron do? He made a golden calf. Okay, so Jeroboam said, these are your gods that led you out of Egypt. So therefore, they began to worship here. Now Jeroboam, it says in scripture, that the priesthood, he chose his own priest. He went totally against scripture, totally against God's word, and he set up his own form of religion. So there was the Levites, no Levites. The priest, they were not from the Levitical tribe. So he got his own priesthood and he just set it up and he worshiped here. Now the sin of Jeroboam, became a pattern that the rest of the kings in Israel would follow. It says in 1 Kings 15, 33, In the third year of Asa, king of Judah, Basha, son of Ahijah, became king of all Israel in Tirsa, and he reigned 24 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, walking in the ways of Jeroboam and in his sin, which he had caused Israel to commit. And you just see, if you read your Bible, you'll see repeatedly, that these kings walked in the ways of Jeroboam. So now Jeroboam becomes the heir in a bad way of all the sin that continues to happen because all the seceding kings follow Jeroboam's pattern, which tells us that oftentimes what we do, we can set in our, whether it be our families, in our lineages, in our legacy, we can set patterns and we can cause damage to our lineage and we can be a blessing to our lineage. So what happens? The years roll by, so the kingdom became divided in about, let's say 925 BC. 200 years later, now the Assyrians are gonna come in and they're gonna wipe out the nation of Israel, that's the 10 northern tribes, and they're gonna be deported to Assyria with just a few living in the land. 80 years later, as a result of reading the scriptures, Josiah became king of Judah and chose to follow God with all his heart. And he led one of the biggest revivals Israel ever experienced. I love Josiah, he became king when he was eight. His forefathers were wicked and he led one of the greatest revivals. 
It says this in 2 Kings 22, 1, it says, Josiah was eight years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. His mother's name was Jedidiah, daughter of Adiah. She was from Bosketh. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in all his ways, in all of the ways of his father, not turning aside to the left or to the right. And it says in 2 Kings 23, 25, Before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise afterward. Now it was Josiah. Why do we mention Josiah? Because Josiah later on gained strength in the northern tribes. They begin to unite with him, and he is the one who destroyed this altar right here. It says in 2 Kings 23, 15, Furthermore, the altar that was at Bethel, that was the one down south, and the high place which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin, that he had made, even that altar and the high place he broke down. Then he demolished its stones, ground them to dust, and burned the Asherah. Asherah was the female goddess who was kind of the counterpart, you might say the wife of, in an understandable way, of Baal. So you had Baal, the masculine god, and Asher was like the female god. So it was, Josiah says in 2 Kings 23, Josiah also removed all the houses of the high places which were in the cities of Samaria, which the kings of Israel had made provoking the Lord, and he did to them just as he had done in Bethel. So. Once again, in summary, Jeroboam sets up this altar and the golden calf was up there and then the altar was right here and they would sacrifice these animals to this false god, the calf, golden calf, instead of the true and living God. And so that became the downfall. God warned Jeroboam, did not listen, and so time goes on, the nation does not repent and turn, and so they're deported. They're removed from their land. And for a Jew, that was unbearable. That was, that was losing your heritage and your, and your identity. So, what are some faith lessons that we can learn from this city of Dan and especially this place right here? Well, despite God supernaturally revealing himself two times to Solomon, he turned away from the Lord in his latter years. He did well for most of his life. He had received a vision at Gibeon. God gave him supernatural wisdom, understanding. He blessed him. And Solomon walked with the Lord for many years. It says in scripture that he loved the Lord. But in his latter years, he turned away. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, and for those of us who have been Christians a while, sometimes it's easy in our latter years to fall away. In fact, scripture is filled with many examples of those who started well, but they ended poorly. So the lesson for us is, are we gonna end well? And uh, the Apostle Paul you know, sums it up wonderfully. He says, I fought the fight. He says, I finished the race. He describes the purpose of life. He says, I fought the good fight. And to get to the finish line, it's a fight. It takes every ounce you've got. There's, there's the, the forces of evil, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We've got our sinful nature. We've got our culture around us, and it's a fight. In fact, scripture says that we have a war going on within us. We have the sinful nature, and so it's a fight. And to get to the finish line, it's gonna be a battle. It's not gonna be easy. So Paul says, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. The race, that's your course of life. He says, I've done it. Is there anything more that you would want to say at your parting? I mean, that's it, isn't it? That's, that's what we're shooting for. I fought it, the good fight, I finished the race. And you're gonna be tired at the end. So are we apathetic and lukewarm in our Christian lives, in our relationship with the Lord? Despite God supernaturally revealing himself two times to Jeroboam, he turned his back on God and built altars to false gods all throughout the land. Now God gives grace to each person to receive and obey him, but to those who reject him, that grace will turn to judgment. 
The more grace we receive and we reject, the greater the judgment will be. So Jeroboam will have great judgment because he received grace. Solomon will have great judgment because he received much grace and then turn away from the Lord. The sin of Jeroboam, as we mentioned, became a pattern now for all of Israel to follow. And as we alluded to, what kind of example are we? What kind of example are we to our children, uh, to our relatives, in our circle of influence, in our jobs, in our churches? Uh, what kind of lineage, uh, legacy, so to speak, are we leaving? God says that I will visit the sins of the fathers to the second and third generation. So the seeds that we plant will affect generations and, and we create in them default systems that take extra work to get out of, so to speak. So as we raise our children or have influence with our grandchildren, whatever it might be, it's vital that we walk in the ways of the Lord and teach them to do so, so that they can have, be effective instead of have, being crippled with our sinful backgrounds. We all have a story, we all have backgrounds, but for us, the question is, are we gonna break those cycles? And we can, we are more than conquerors in Christ. We have all the grace we need to break those cycles. So we need to break those cycles and create new legacies. Now in 722, the Northern 10 tribes, as we mentioned, were deported. And for them, that was tragic and never would they return. Some have called them the 10 lost tribes of Israel. Now, it's not true that they were all lost because there did remain in the country a few. The Assyrians were one of the most fiercest war machines that existed, and they were brutal. It says when they led them away, they led them away with rings in their noses. Just yank them. Many of them were tortured. Many of them were violated. Many of them were killed. And the slaves that went were just painfully treated. And that was the Assyrians. And when they fought, they purposefully were as mean and torturous as possible so that the other surrounding nations would see what would happen. They would say, you want to fight? Okay, you can surrender and save your life or you can fight and this is what's going to be your end. So they were fierce, they were mean. So they were deported. Even though they had warning after warning after warning after warning, the prophet Elijah, the prophet Elisha, they ministered into this culture. They didn't listen. So they were judged. Now God is a God of mercy, but God is also a just God. And when a person rejects that grace, and, uh, and God knows when the end's gonna be, when that person's, you know, won't receive or there's no hope for them, uh, God steps in. And eventually if a person, you know, rejects uh, God's grace through Christ, the rest of their life and they die in that state, then obviously scripture says that they're gonna to go to the eternal lake of fire. That's just a reality. Now the worship of these false gods here in Bethel and in Dan, once again, they became the downfall of the nation of Israel. And they were false gods, but I guess the question for us is, you know, they had this false god. The Bible talks about false gods and idols. Those are anything that we place before the Lord. I mean, a false god can be something that takes God's place, where he's no longer on the throne of our lives. And so we might have to ask ourselves a question, we should, what areas of my life do I have affections that are greater than, than God? What, uh, what might be my false gods? And then when I know them, will I be like Jeroboam and Solomon, or will I repent and give those up? And then we have the example of Josiah, who followed the Lord with all his heart. So what did he do? He tore him down. And it says there was no king like him. And like I say, uh, Josiah became king when he was eight years old. He didn't find the Bible until he was maybe 20 or so years old. It was found in the temple. And then the priest began to read it. And he just, he just repented in sackcloth and ashes. So Josiah, at eight years old, even though he had a bad lineage, God, the grace of God is sufficient, and he followed the Lord, he broke the cycle, and he tore this stuff down. So I guess for us then, uh, where are we gonna fall? Each person, regardless of any place they are, no matter of what their background is, 
God's grace is more than sufficient to bring us out of where we've been. And so are we going to do that? And are we going to receive that grace? And for those that might be listening or watching by video, the question is, am I going to respond to God's grace? Uh, but anyway, this right here you're looking at, the uh, downfall of the ten tribes of Israel. And eventually the southern tribes would fall as well in 586 B.C. So anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this time and I hope you've been challenged as well. Some great application for us today. And we find in Scripture that these things were written beforehand for our example that we might learn from them. So we see these examples, we see these principles that are applicable for us today. So thank you for your attentiveness and may God richly bless you as you seek to follow the Lord and, and leave a, a godly legacy.